Good afternoon, everybody. And you're very welcome to the very first in the series of the In Conversation with uh, series with myself, Dr. Gavin Murphy, here at the School of Education, Trinity College, Dublin. I'd like to just wish you all a really warm welcome on this very cold and wet Friday evening here in Ireland, this side of the Atlantic. And I was just thinking that maybe one benefit uh, today of our lives being online pretty much all the time is that at least we don't have to travel for events like this. So you can be cozy where you are or wherever you're catching up on this webinar. And also how lucky we are to have such brilliant guests like Carrie. So today for the inaugural webinar of the series, we're joined by Carrie Conaway from Harvard Graduate School of Education. And we're going to talk about using evidence in practice. Carrie's research focus and expertise is really, really relevant for this inaugural webinar on leadership and policy, given how in Ireland, much of our educational reforms have focused on this very topic, especially things like looking at our schools and school self-evaluation. So before we begin, I'd just like to formally introduce Carrie and warmly welcome her and again to thank her for her generosity in being here today. So Carrie is, as I said, a senior lecturer at Harvard Graduate School of Education and she's co-author with Nora Gordon of Common Sense Evidence, the Education Leader's Guide to Using Data and Research. Until June 2019, she was the Chief Strategy and Research Officer for the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and led the agency's Office of Planning and Research. Carrie has nearly 20 years of experience in integrating research and practice to improve public policy. And other publications of hers to date include research focused on research practice partnerships and how we can learn from our response to COVID. So we're gonna to begin today uh, with a short presentation uh, from Carrie, and then we're gonna move into a conversation over and back between Carrie and myself before moving into some questions that we welcome you, the audience, to put to us during the uh, presentation and chat through the question and answer function. So now I'm going to turn my camera off and it's over to you, Carrie. Great, thanks so much, Gavin. And let me just share my screen so I can get my slides going here, I think. All right, so this slide's looking good, I hope. So, uh, Gavin, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm really excited to uh, talk with and learn from you all and learn a little bit about the Irish context and, and how you all think about evidence. I wanted to start with what is the value of evidence for education systems? I mean, we often hear these exhortations for practitioners to base their decisions in evidence or use evidence-based practices. So I wanted to talk about why people think this is important, which I think actually requires us to first sort of talk about what do we even mean by evidence? I think in the United States, in my view, we often either take too broad of a view or too narrow of a view. The broad view, um, often so you'll hear people just claim they used research to develop a recommendation or a policy, so it is evidence-based. Now, whether they could actually cite the specific research that they called on to make that claim and whether that study was well designed and relevant for the context they're applying it to is a different issue. Uh, but that's sort of a very broad view of evidence. And then sometimes we use a very narrow definition of evidence, um, often meaning findings from a randomized control trial or some other similar impact evaluation that's trying to measure the causal impact of a program. Our federal education law uses evidence in that way something like 70 times, including some pretty stringent requirements on our lowest performing schools to use evidence in that way. I'm not as familiar with the Irish context, obviously, but I did look a little bit at the looking at our schools documents and the school self-evaluation process. And I see some fairly broad and different uses of the word evidence too in, in those contexts. So what I wanna do is actually just ground us in the dictionary definition. I always feel like that's a good place to work or to start. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines evidence in part as the available body of information indicating whether an opinion or proposition is true or valid. And to me, there's two key things in that definition. One is something that's not present. There's nothing in there about the research methodology used to generate that information. There's nothing that says you have to have a randomized controlled trial for it to count for evidence. It's just the available body of information. And then the second key thing is that it says indicating whether the proposition is true. To me, that word indicating means that you need some sort of data or some sort of evidence, for lack of a better word, and not just an assertion that something is research-based. 
Now, if up to me, if I were writing the dictionary definition, I would make a friendly amendment here. I would add two adjectives. I would add the words relevant and convincing. And here's why. When we talk about relevance in education research, it's really important to think about how evidence that was produced there and then applies here and now. When you read research papers, you'll often see that researchers will include things about like the demographics of the students or the size of the school the, the program was implemented in. And those are dimensions of relevance that are important, but I just think this is it's a much deeper and richer issue than just this sort of do the numbers match up. It's also to me really important to think about, for example, the resources that are required to implement the program. If you think that it's something, uh, if the program you're interested in is something that's way more expensive than you can afford, or it requires skills in your educators that they don't currently have, and it's gonna take some work to build, it may not be as relevant for you as something that's more approachable and affordable for your context. I also think, there's so much about the enabling conditions that are about why this program was successful that just often isn't reported in research. To me, you really need to know about like the legal context, the historical context, the cultural context, um, stakeholder values in the local area. And all those things matter as part of what makes evidence relevant for practice. On the convincing side, this to me is about that studies should be well-designed to make the claim they're trying to make. Different studies make different types of claims. Some try to make a causal claim that X caused Y. Some are just trying to describe the world around us, or they're trying to tell us what we already know from other research. And what matters is being able to evaluate whether the research is well-designed for that claim and whether it's making a claim that's appropriate given how it's designed. And so that's how I would amend the definition of evidence to bring it into a little more um, nuance for a practitioner context. So with that is what I mean, at least when I say evidence, what is its value for education systems? I think it has two big values. One is helping us learn from what we already know, and one is helping us learn from our own work. When it comes to learning from what we already know, there I'm thinking about using what we know from existing research to make better informed choices. Lots of existing research could potentially be really useful for practice. But we don't use it often in education as well as we could. And there's lots of reasons for that. I'm happy to talk about that during the Q&A. Um, but what I think is important is that it will help practitioners make better choices if they can use more of what we already know as part of their decision making. I would never argue that evidence should be the only thing that matters because I think all those other contextual factors really matter too. And a part of the role of a practitioner is to make judgments about how evidence fits in. But I would argue we could use it more than we have. In order to do that, I really recommend that practitioners start by looking for the big picture. Look for summaries, meta-analyses, synthetic literature reviews, and not just individual studies. And that's because individual studies might not be representative of the whole range of findings in a field. We see this a lot with nutrition research where you'll see headlines in the paper, wine causes cancer, wine prevents cancer. And that's part of the scientific process. Any individual study might find a strong positive or a strong negative effect of a program. What you want is the sense of when this has been tried in lots of different places, in general, what happens? What's our overall sense of the direction of impact of that program? So that's why I always recommend to, to look where you can for synthetic summaries, unless the research has been produced in your context or a context very similar to yours, because then it might be more relevant than some of the others. How should you use existing research? The key thing to remember is that research use is a social activity. Research use is not very effective when the model is, I'm gonna hand you a paper and you're gonna read it and then you're gonna do something. Humans need organizational routines and structures that help them create opportunities to make meaning from research in their local context. Things like staff meetings. When I worked at the state uh, government here in Massachusetts for many years and my colleagues would often run like quarterly staff meetings where the whole team would read a paper together and then talk about what does it mean for them? What can they take away? How can they improve their work based on what they learned? And those opportunities to interpret findings in your own context are the way in which research will have impact in organizations. When it comes to learning from your own work, that's really about improving your work over time. 
my experience is that we really only know one way to improve things in this world. We try something, we learn from it and get some feedback, and then we make some changes. That's true for individual students as their learning happens. And that's true for those of us working in systems and organizations. Organizations try things, learn from them and make change. And so every improvement strategy I've ever come across is some version of the same thing, whether it's plan, do, study, act, improvement science, deliverology. I certainly saw this in your school self-evaluation, that same orientation. And so if we want to get better outcomes from our education systems, I would argue we need to get better at learning from our work. That's the piece that's missing. My advice about this goes back to that word of convincing. What kind of evidence should convince us to change our practice? What, what could we learn in the study phase of plan, do, study, act that would convince us we needed to act differently? In this type of evidence use, we are often trying to make a causal claim. We're not just trying to say, here's, how, here's what the world looks like. We're trying to say, I changed X and it caused Y. I grouped students by reading ability instead of treating them all the same and they did better on the end of unit test. Or I expanded the school learning day and I saw that students did better on the end of year exam or they were more likely to attend school or whatever outcome you care about. And so if that's the claim we're trying to make, our research, our study needs to be well designed to support that claim. If, if I were a super nerdy researcher, I would say that, you know, most, most people would say that randomized control trials are the best way to establish causality because you don't have to worry about selection bias, who picked, who decided they wanted to participate in a program that might be different from somebody who chose not to. I don't think we need to run randomized control trials in order to learn, but I do think we could be a little more sophisticated than what I often see in two ways. One is collecting baseline data and the other is establishing a strong comparison group. Uh, the, both of those are important for answering the question relative to what. So how do we know what would have happened had we not done this policy? Too often I see educators just looking at like a pre-post and not thinking about what else might have changed at the same time. I'll give you an example from here in the United States, but I think it will be relevant for you as well. We have Every school district in our country is changing lots of things about how it does its work to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And they might wanna learn from that. Did, did this shift we made in our math strategy for our fifth graders help, help them catch up or improve their outcomes? But we are also at the same time making lots of changes in our education system to address the ongoing issue of racism in our society. And we're implementing lots of changes in the way teachers do their practice and programs and things like that. We have two things changing at the same time. So if we see improvement from the beginning of this year to the end, we won't know whether it's our response to COVID-19 or the racial equity work that we're doing that is leading to that change. So we have to think carefully about comparison groups who maybe are exposed to one of these strategies but not the other to help us differentiate those things. So going back to common sense evidence, relevant, convincing information that indicates whether something is true or valid, I think that this is well within reach of educators. And really what my work is about is trying to empower practitioners and policymakers and educators so that they don't feel overwhelmed by research or feel like they're being beaten over the head by evidence, but instead know where to look to find the information that can help them do their job better and how to ask questions that will help them improve their practice, while also acknowledging that evidence is not and should never be the only thing that matters in their decisions. And so Gavin, that sort of opens up the frame of how I think about my work and what I do, and I would love to chat. It's given that you've worked in, in the state as well uh, in, in your previous role on this very topic. I suppose one of the reasons why I thought this would be a really good theme and why I really wanted to draw on your expertise to begin with is that for many uh, practitioners, school leaders, researchers, even in the area, it's hard to get your head around the kind of slippiness of language that's in the area. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you want to engage with, you know, using your, your evidence and suddenly you're kind of dealing with research and data and you feel probably, I, I think it's fair to say, overwhelmed. How do you begin to make sense of all of these terminologies that float around out there? 
Well, you saw I spent the first couple of minutes of my presentation defining what I meant by evidence, right? For exactly this reason, we all use these words really differently. I know researchers often make very clear to them, clear distinctions between data, information, research, evidence. My experience with my colleagues at the agency and with the practitioners I've worked with in schools and districts in Massachusetts is that they do not. Mm -hmm. And my general preference is to use normal English words and not technical language, because I think why, why expend all that effort trying to shift somebody's thinking? What I wanna do is meet you where you are and use the language you find comfortable. So to me, I think about how do I want the field to use this information available to them? I don't really care whether it's technically to me data versus evidence. I want them to use all of those forms of information as part of that available body of evidence from the OED definition to make the judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's certainly something that even those with the best of intentions can feel really overwhelmed by, I suppose. And part of that is you're wanting to implement policy, enact policy in your context. And you start to realize as you move from perhaps even policy document to policy document, the language is slippy. So there is a tension sometimes, isn't there, between what policy espouses or you know, kind of suggests that it would like in terms of teachers, school leaders as researchers, Mm -hmm. and what happens at the level of practice. Not yeah. to say that practice isn't doing what's right, but sometimes practice is possibly even ahead of the policy making, right? So mm -hmm. there's this tension between the two. Maybe you could talk a little more to that. Yeah, you're making me think a lot, Gavin, about um, here in the United States, our federal law that was just reauthorized a couple of years ago actually has a very detailed definition of what they mean by evidence, but it's that super narrow definition that I mentioned. And then there's this, other, there's sort of like the other category, right? It's called, it's tier four is what this is called. But like, to me, that's where the real power of that law is that, that that tier four was sort of like, if you don't have any of these other kinds of evidence, just learn from your work, learn from your work and use it to evaluate and improve. And like, to me, that's, that's where we're trying to orient people. That's what we want people to do. And let's not worry so much about whether it's a randomized controlled trial or a correlational study with regression and blah, 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 blah. It's sort of, it's, to me, it's missing the point of using information to help improve our decision making. Yeah, yeah. So then if we take this, what effectively is a really broad view of what uh, engagement with research is mm -hmm. in terms of a practitioner point of view, then it does, as you say, provide this opportunity, a really great context-based, typically job embedded mm -hmm. opportunity for very meaningful professional learning. Um, I know this is something that you've written about quite a bit and it, it's kind of a key message in your book. I think certainly the Irish context provides an opportunity for that and I know in our conversations leading up to this we talked about uh, just how nourishing it can be maybe from that professional perspective. So research is learning rather than research as a, a task that's you know given from on high from policymakers, how do we reconceive of it as, as a learning opportunity? I mean, there, there is no better way to get somebody interested in your research than to do research about your own context, right? Like, I mean, I used to tell the research, external researchers I worked with at the agency, like, you, you want to build such a strong connection to the work that someone's actually doing that, like, that you don't have to try to get them to read the paper. They want to read the paper because you're answering a question that they care about. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's great for practitioners to start from learning about their own work, whether that's in um, their, their classroom, their school, their school district, they're comparing to other places, things like that. Mm -hmm. What I don't want people to do is stop there because I think there's so much of value from the research world that people miss out on if they are only looking at their own context. Um, and I also, going back to my opening remarks, I think we, Educators, my experience, are, are very good. If you think of the plan, do, study, act model, they're very good at planning, doing, and acting, uh, but they don't always plan for the study as well as we could. And so I, I really want to push people to just think a little harder about like baseline data and a comparison group as a way to make that localized learning a little more compelling and a little stronger evidence for the, the practice you want to change. It's yeah. sort of funny to me that we even have this conversation, right? Because all research is, is a structured way of learning. This should not be hard. I mean, educators love learning. That is why they're in this field. 
And so we shouldn't have this as divide as large as we do because we're all on the same page in the end. And it's just a matter of building some vocabulary, I think, to bring people more, more together on that. Yeah, I agree. And I think in Ireland, there's really great promise given, you know, in, in the kind of system movement towards uh, how we've reformed our teacher education system to embed uh, research project as part of that and how even in terms of how we develop school leaders, a commitment for university led approaches is part of that too. So I think there is great promise in, in how research, but possibly I think from what you're saying too, there are implications for us in the university. And I think you've spoke to that as well. You've spoken to that as well today about how we see ourselves and how we promote research and just maybe tone it down a little bit and how we communicate that. So there's probably a lesson there for us too, as much as there is for educators, as you say, in the plan, do study act element, there are probably lessons for us as well. Yeah, I think, you know, it comes down to this to me, practitioners solve problems and researchers answer questions. And so they're, they're fundamentally oriented in a different way. And we need to bring them closer together so that the practitioners both can ask better questions of the researchers instead of letting the researchers develop the questions. Why don't we have the practitioners involved in that? And then helping practitioners be better equipped to evaluate the quality of the answer. So on that side, and then the researchers, I agree with you. I think we have a lot of work to do with our colleagues around helping to communicate a little more clearly and effectively mm -hmm. um, what we actually know from research. And much of that, I guess, too, although it's probably a separate discussion, but for perhaps some academics who may be in attendance today, it's about thinking about our impact, thinking about how engaged we are. And I know there is some really exciting work happening in the Irish context through things like Campus Engage to that, in that respect. So, um, yeah, there's really exciting ways, to, particularly in schools, I think, of professional education, like education, like schools of education. Um, great scope there, as you say, to work with the, the boundaries of practice and research which is what we're aiming to do in the university missions, I guess. Totally, I think that's exactly the direction we need to be going. I mean, certainly in the United States, I imagine this is true for you as well. You know, there's, there's a real reckoning about what is the value of higher education at this, you know, why are we spending all this money on this incredibly expensive product? And are we really learning anything? We, the universities, I think, have to demonstrate that what they're doing actually has value. Mm -hmm. And I would never argue that basic research doesn't have value. I think we learn tremendous amounts from that. Mm -hmm. But I think we undervalue applied research that really can make a more immediate impact on, uh, on the education sector for, for our context, but even other you know, policy schools or law schools or things like that. Mm -hmm. So maybe just parking kind of the, the higher ed focus now for a second and thinking about schools out there, because I know there'll be people in attendance today or catching up afterwards who are really enthusiastic, really well-intentioned, thinking probably as you're talking, yes, yes, you know, but let's say they want to start tomorrow to review how they're using evidence and they want something practical to take away from this. What advice would you give? I know you talked about baseline data comparison group. What yeah. else would you throw into the mix? Yeah, this, we have a whole chapter on this in our book, so I would definitely recommend, you know, uh, shameless self-promotion. We do talk about this in the book. But um, so remember, I said there's two ways you can use evidence, learning from your own work and learning from the work of others. Mm -hmm. And the learning from your own work, I would really advise, start with one project, one initiative, one program, one strategy that you want to learn something about. And think about what are the questions you need to answer in order to know whether this is going the way you hoped, whether you're focused on the right priority, and then whether it's having the impact it would have. Mm -hmm. So you can think of that as like a learning agenda but just for one, one thing, because you can't take on the whole world all at once. Mm -hmm. And so if you're an individual teacher, that could be a strategy you're trying in your classroom. If you're a principal, it could be something at the school level. It doesn't, it could be any grain size, but pick one thing to evaluate and then do a little better job, as I was saying, on the relative to what question, the baseline data and the comparison group, mm -hmm. and just try to build a little bit more sophistication in that way of working. Mm -hmm. But the learning from what you already know, um, one, one simple thing is just to find ways to increase your exposure to research. We all as professionals read about our practice and, you know, we have trade magazines, we have other sources. I don't think you need to read academic journals necessarily, but places that do a good job of translating research are a great place to start. Mm -hmm. um, here in the U.S., we have uh, Kappen Magazine, which is run by the Phi Delta Kappen Society, a, journal for practitioners that they have 
a really good job editorially on making sure research is well communicated. There's um, Education Next magazine. There's uh, some of our national, like the certainly the New York Times and the National Public Radio and those sorts of places. But going back to the point of my presentation, it can't end with, I'm gonna send an email out with all the, this study to all my staff, right? Mm -hmm. That's because you need to build in the social activity. Right. So think of a way to do that, whether it's um, a journal club, a meeting, a discussion, a meeting, some way for people to engage and not just read. Mm -hmm. um, I think those, that can make a big difference for practice. Yeah. So it's pretty eclectic then. There's no silver bullet here in terms of a blueprint to, to get this going. And probably that also lends itself to thinking about how we practice the research, as you mentioned and touched on. It isn't just, for example, action research we can look at. We can look at different approaches to doing practitioner research as well, right? Oh, yeah, I think there's a huge range. And I think, you know, start with what sounds interesting and fun to you, you know, like start, start with an easy thing and, and build from there. When I started at the agency in 2007, I was the first research director in any state government agency, in state education agency in the country in the United States with, with a job like mine that was meant to be more strategic, not just like quick response to the legislature data runs. And we started with just a couple of projects. I picked one thing that basically my boss told me, get a study going on this. One thing that the board chair was like his big initiative. And I knew if we didn't get some data on it, he was gonna come around in a year and ask us what happened and we better plan for that, right? And like one external researcher partnership. And that was, that was plenty. And that kept us going for a while. And then we, you know, by the time I left, we had a full research agenda across the whole agency and, you know, lots more stuff, but start small and start with something that seems useful. Yeah. You mentioned just something that I think is really important when we think about leadership and leadership as influence, especially leadership through collaborative activity, that kind of collaborative professionalism that effectively is at the heart of what we're speaking about today. Schools sometimes can nominate, as is typical in other jurisdictions around the world, and even in Ireland in some school context, there will be an individual research lead or somebody who's employed as a data coach who's either internal to the school or, or external to the school um, to, you know, or even a school self-evaluation, as is common in our school. There'll be somebody who's almost individually, at least by title, although that isn't the case in practice, responsible for that. I'm just wondering what you think about this kind of sense of this sim symbolism, even, um, of an individual person responsible for these what we're effectively talking about today is is core work involved in not only just improving your school but learning about your practice uh, and so on yeah this is a really hard balance right because on the one hand you want everyone to own it and so it should be part of everyone's practice on the other hand we know if everyone owns it no one owns it so we need to have someone who's kind of leading the work but then that makes the incentive of like well, that's their job. I don't have to worry about research or data or evidence or whatever. And so, I mean, I guess my thoughts on this one, and maybe this is just colored by my own experience because I was that one person, right, at the agency. Um, one thing is I think it's super hard. What you're trying to create is an organizational change, like a, way, a different way of thinking about your work. Mm -hmm. That is very hard to lead from the outside. So I do think there's a role for internal Coaches and stuff can be helpful to support that, but there's got to be someone internal who's like, they're going to beat the drum on that all the time. And their position within the organization really matters. I think one of the reasons I was able to be successful at, at the Massachusetts agency was because my boss recognized I needed to be on the leadership team hearing those conversations. Even though I was a relatively junior manager, most people at my rank wouldn't have been there. But because of the nature of the role where I'm trying to help us in, improve our, our work and advance strategically, I had to be in those conversations and have relationships with those people. So I wasn't like shunted off in the corner, the data person who doesn't you know, really know what we're doing. And so I feel like that structural element is important. And then going back to the idea of organization routines and practices, like some sort of routines that force you to encounter evidence and data frequently and using it. Mm -hmm. Could be run by that data person, could be run by a more senior leader. I mean, you can imagine lots of ways to structure it, mm -hmm. but I think th the routines help balance out for the like, it's that person's job and nobody else's issue. Yeah. I guess it's thinking about what you can do through structures, but also through your culture to yeah. almost relentlessly apply gentle pressure towards the 
potential yep. afforded to the professionals and no doubt the students in the organization by becoming uh, researchly in your focus. Um, just before I move to the next kind of question or two, before I wrap up, just a reminder to everybody who's in the audience to feel free through the chat function to pose some questions, comments, anything you feel perhaps you'd like to direct towards Carrie, more than happy to, to, to shout those out as we move to the end of our conversation. Um, I, I noticed as well in our preparation for today that Harvard Graduate School of Education has a course called Evidence, and it's a course you teach. And it's going to eventually become in, embedded into all of your master's students learning. So maybe you could just share with us a little bit about the reason why that's been brought about and what it's hoped it will achieve. And again, I suppose, thinking of the implications for how we engage with research and practice at schools of education. Yeah. Yeah, Gavin, I'm so excited to talk about this. It was actually, I loved my old job. I've genuinely loved it. But the reason I came to Harvard was so that I could contribute to this class because I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. It's a um, course, we're, we're revising our master's program. And this will be the first time in the history of our education school that all students, no matter which of our master's programs they're in, will have a foundational curriculum in common, one element of which is this course. And so I'm co-teaching it with Jimmy Kim, who's a literacy scholar and a fantastic guy. He's been leading this work for several years. And what we're trying to do, the reason we're doing that is because we think that there is, we need, we need to give practitioners more language and ability to evaluate the quality of evidence as part of professionalization of the field. We think professional fields have a body of evidence that they draw on in order to make decisions and choices. They also use other things too, right? For, like if you think of a medical doctor, Certainly they use research evidence. They also use their professional judgment. We're not trying to substitute for that, but we think that we could do a better job in the education field of giving people the, the tools and vocabulary to use research effectively in their practice. And so we teach the course using a framework of different types of evidence. Uh, we talk about descriptive evidence, whether it's uh, qualitative or quantitative, causal evidence, process evidence, which is about like the how and why, and then synthetic evidence, which does not mean um, fake. It means from a synthesis. <laughs> I, don't, I learned that. I didn't know that word before we started teaching the class. Um, and we help people learn how to identify which type of evidence it is and then what makes for good quality evidence of that type because you don't judge qualitative data the same way you do a causal impact estimate, right? So we're trying to give people a little bit of vocabulary. What I actually did this morning before joining this call was we had students write reflection papers about what they were taking away from the course and how they envisioned using it. And they're, maybe they're just sucking up to the professor, but they are saying exactly what we hoped. We've had, I've read about half of them so far and the students are all saying like, I totally see how I needed this skill. This, you know, the course was challenging and I, you know, was, I had to work hard, but I learned a lot about, I can see, we have a lot of students who are also currently practitioners and they could say like, give specific examples of ways they've used it in their class or with a leader and they're just, it's really exciting. So it'll be not next school year, but the one after that is when all students will be required to take it. And I'm really looking forward to hopefully touching 650 future education leaders in the United States and all over the world every year with this content. Yeah, that's definitely really exciting. And it gives us food for thought, I guess, as well in graduate schools of education and thinking about how we typically teach around research methodology, research methods and implications there. Um, I'm just noticing a question come in here. Um, first of all, um, just a comment from Carmel Cairns, who works with the Teaching Council, who says that she's really loving the conversation and talks about demystifying research, which I think we definitely, hopefully gave some you uh, certainly shared some insights around that today. And then from Professor Carmel O'Sullivan from our School of Education here in Trinity, she's asking, what has been the impact, if any, of COVID on research in schools and classrooms? Oh my goodness. I, you know, I, I left the agency about six months before COVID happened. So I didn't have to handle the impact myself. But what I'm hearing from my colleagues is basically every project is screwed up in some way, right? Like, <laughs> because you, like, for example, our, in our state, I think all over the country, we did not run our state assessment last year. We have no data on last school year. The test, not the test scores are the only or best measure of anything, but they are certainly helpful data. And we don't have any data from last year. I think there's a decent chance we might not have much data this year either. Mm -hmm. um, there's people who were doing, like, field-based research that was in schools, like, 
what are you supposed to do now? My actually, Jimmy, my colleague who teaches the evidence class with me, is running a randomized control trial right now in a school district in North Carolina, mm-hmm. and have to completely redesign the intervention to work for the virtual format. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know, like my colleagues who work at our Institute for Education Sciences, which among other things provides a lot of research grants, have basically had to rewrite all the deliverables for all the grants because people just can't do what they said they would be doing. So. It'll be interesting to see where we land in a year from now. I mean, I hope maybe this gets us to go back to some basic questions that are a little easier to answer in this context, but also really important. Um, I'm hoping we can maybe learn a little bit more about just the ways students learn and what helps support students in contexts like this. It's also certainly brought out the gross inequalities in our system are even more evident now. Maybe we'll learn more about that and how to redu- reduce those issues. But I was yeah, going to have time to be a researcher. Traditionally, I guess a lot of the uh, movement around research and practitioner research is focused on questions around excellence and probably neglected or just tagged on afterwards questions connected to equity. And I guess the challenge is really certainly in an applied way, which is where we can really make the change is actually seeing those as uh, joint pursuits. Yes, I mean, I think ideally that's that's where we want to be, right? We want both of those things happening at the same time, and I do think you're right that we overemphasize the excellence and miss the certainly in Massachusetts, we're we're sort of in the United States considered like a a star state. We we're typically number one nationally every time we do a box scores, or I guess you guys call them league tables of who, like who's the top to bottom scores. But our our achievement gaps are among the largest in the nation. Like, yeah, our black kids score higher than the average of all kids in lots of states, but man, it's a big difference between them and the white kids, right? Like, we need to focus more attention on that. So if that's an outcome of this, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I'm just going to turn my attention to some of the questions that are coming in as well now, Carrie. I just, I'll go to them in order here. So uh, one from Jennifer McMahon, who's from the Department of Psychology at the University of Limerick. She's just thank you for your insights and agreeing with you and she's uh, saying that she really likes the content of your programme. She's asking, what do you think about more informal pathways to building capacity in research literacy? Not everybody wants to do a formal course, but it's an important skill set for all. Yep. That was my old job. I spent 13 years doing exactly that. When I started at the agency, nobody asked me to come in and make them all take a research literacy class, right? Like the, but it was just like, let's answer the question that's in front of us. Yeah. And so to give a concrete example, I think I mentioned that like, there was like a particular project my boss wanted me to do. On my, it's actually literally my first day. He gives me this list. And one of the items is just get a study going evaluating the impact of charter schools in, in Massachusetts, which are, um, a type of public school that is outside the traditional system and they're a little, they can have a little more space to be free from some of the rules and regs and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so there's this pretty old question of like, are these students actually doing better? But there's a huge selection bias problem because the kids who choose that model are probably different from the ones who didn't and it's hard to account for that. Mm-hmm. So I arrived to the agency with this question, a charter school office that has never interacted with an external researcher before. And like they had a, a staff person who was pretty good at asking questions, but had no research training, so didn't really know how to evaluate the quality of the answers. And then, by the way, on the other hand, wonderful, but extremely nerdy researchers. So like, if there's a distribution of nerdy, they're like off my screen, <laughs> nerdy, and like the, just worlds apart. But we answer, you know, help them understand the value of the particular way the researchers wanted to answer the question because students, um, there's a lottery for whether students get in so we can use the randomization or random um, assignment from the lottery to help get the impact. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to teach them everything. I just had to teach them that one thing, right? And then we, then that begat another question. And then we learned about how do we answer that type of question. And when I looked back nine years later, that research team, that extremely nerdy research team, first of all, it was they decided that they wanted to put on a research conference for practitioners about research in Massachusetts. They did a, um, they implemented a no Greek equations rule. So like they had really shifted their practice and the practitioners we worked with were much more able to engage with the research than they had been. And it's one of these things, it's hard to see the change as it's happening, but that moment really crystallized for me going back to um, Jennifer's question that like, embedded stuff over time can make a huge difference it's just it, it's hard to put your finger on it when it's happening but it is happening yeah i guess one way even in thinking of teacher education in ireland the fact that now teachers who are going through their initial teacher education are doing a two-year master program 
Mm. then go out to schools and it does create that cultural change irrespective of whether a particular leader in a single organization does the professionalization process and Mm. professional education tends to kick that off a little um and david has a question as well um and says many of our master's level student teachers do a systematic review as their dissertation their professional dissertation what would you say is the value of this oh i love that idea that's kind of cool so i mean especially if it's like embedded in a um, some way of helping them know how to do that work, which I presume that it would be since it's in an education setting. It feels like, it's, and especially if they know, have a pretty good idea where they're going to be practicing and what type of work they're going to be doing so they could do something on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it would give you a chance to build the skills around like evaluating the quality of research and also learning deeply about one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love it if it were coupled with something that was more about like continuing that learning in their learning context going forward, something that, so you would get both halves of the ways you can use evidence, but I like that idea. Okay. Um, And a question from Carmel Kearns. Does Carrie think there is a danger that our ethics approval processes have become so unwieldy and onerous that practitioners are discouraged from engaging in small scale research? And Um, is there any solution to this? Oh, yeah. So that's interesting. I don't know how different your context is than ours. Gavin, can you fill me in a little bit on like how that works? Yeah. So, I mean, largely, I guess you're going to have to negotiate one of the biggest pieces well, of legislation that impacts everybody at the minute is the GDPR around how your information is used and for which purposes. And it's a little bit perhaps of a trigger word for many people because people feel like, oh, you know, how will I go about this? Or perhaps actually it, it prohibits people from even thinking about it because immediately they just think, I possibly can't do that because I couldn't retain the, the data. Certainly, I think if you're in a context where suddenly somebody might be saying, but what about the ethics of this? And it's not part of the organizational rituals like it would be in the university. That can be pretty off-putting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we have some similar issues here. May, I, they might be a little bit different in that the way... Um, research is approved in universities makes a distinction between like research or analysis that's done in a local context for local issues versus something that's attempting to be generalizable. Mm-hmm. And so if it's more like a teacher trying to evaluate their own practice, that would not be considered research that needs like some sort of formal approval. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's that line is fuzzy, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I certainly, like last summer, I was supporting six students, graduate, like doctoral level graduate students who were doing projects in districts and state agencies. And normally what happens is they just go to that agency. They like move to Oklahoma for the summer or move to Nashville, Tennessee or whatever. But because of COVID, they couldn't do that, which meant they were considered external to the agency, which meant they had to go through this super elaborate data sharing extravaganza that like, I think we had at least two that just never actually got data by the end of their, so yeah, it could definitely bog down. Um, The other, in the US, the other big law that is around this, around student privacy is FERPA, um, which I used to often joke is a four letter word because it's just similarly like, it can get a little overwhelming. And I'm not, you know, I, there's a history of some really, nefarious and and ill-considered research that is important that we do not replicate those types of things. This is the reason why we have concerns about like in our country, black people saying you've been experimenting on my people for years and I don't want to take your vaccine because I don't think you're doing things in an ethical and trustworthy way, right? So that's why those rules are there. But I think we can definitely swing too far in the other direction and create a lot of process and bureaucracy that is not actually adding value. I think what it probably does raise is the fact that when we talk about evidence-based approaches or evidence in um, in practice, oftentimes we forget that values are an inherent part of that as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and ethics too. Uh, like, you know, in that sense that they do have an interplay together. Yeah. Yeah, there was a great book a couple of years ago by um, Susanna Loeb and Helen Ladd and two Um, ethicists or or philosophers who do sort of ethics were talking about this intersection between evidence and values. I'm I'm not remembering the name of it off the top of my head, but it was exactly this, that like both of those things matter for how we do our work and we too often wait one over the other. Uh Maybe then one final question before we go today. Um, 
I've often wondered about evidence and truth, and certainly you mentioned COVID here, and we see such raging debate uh, all around the world now around what counts as evidence, and as I say, those questions of truth. I mean, I just wonder, are there challenges too in thinking about evidence, professionalism, questions of truth and communities that maybe we also need to think about that might be unintended consequences that can create conflicts and challenges in the work of professionals as well? Mm. Oh, nice, simple, narrow, easy question. You know, yeah. well, what you made me think about, and this may not have been the direction you wanted to go, so ask me again if not, but it made me think about the value of having people who are affected by the work included in the process of developing the work, right? So um, there's, there's sort of a, a catchphrase, nothing about us without us, right? Yeah. And what you were saying made, it made me think about, um, there's a great resource by an organization called Chicago Beyond. It's, it's called, Why Am I Always Being Researched? And it talks about the seven inequities that get in the way of truth and power. So the way power dynamics between researchers and practitioners and community funders and community organizations affect what different people view as truth and also what, how we can use what we have learned from these various points of view to actually make change. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to think about, about those issues. And it's hard to, um, it's, it's philosophical, but it's core. It's core to the work, right? It's like, how do we know what we know? Mm -hmm. Why do we value what we value? How can we be inclusive in the way we do that work so that we are hearing everyone's perspectives and not just sort of researchers answering what they think is useful, practitioners not talking to their community members when they're generating questions. You know, there's a whole mess that can occur there. Which captures, you know, other movements out there like Student Voice and so on, um, uh, which are really pertinent as well, I think, certainly in the Irish context at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as Anne says on the chat as well, that nothing about us without us can also maximize the impact of the work. Now, I did say that my last question was the final question, but I have one absolutely final question. Okay. Some people say, and it comes back, I think, to what some people might feel again from a professional perspective, a practicing teacher perspective. We talk a lot about evidence-based policymaking. And I know that Stephen Gard and colleagues have often talked about policy-based evidence making. Mm -hmm. How then, just as a parting shot maybe in our conversation for today, uh, do we avoid that policy-based evidence making? In other words, generating all this evidence and losing sight of the purpose of why we do it. Oh, and this is a, such a huge frustration for me because I feel like um, this goes back to sort of the incentives in universities, I think, in particular for university-based researchers, right? I think it's a little different if you're working at a research firm because right, you're getting hired to answer the question the practitioner wants you to answer. But like, I just don't think there's any way we are gonna get better at this if we don't have conversations between the research community and the practice community. I think if researchers are left to their own to invent what they think is a useful question to answer or is maybe gonna get them professional kudos of some sort, but isn't actually answering a question of practice, mm -hmm. and or if practitioners are not using the evidence available to them and just using gut instinct and not bringing in sort of a more rigorous way of thinking about it, we can't fix this problem. Right, so we can't, and we will end up with policy-based evidence making. We end up with a whole bunch of pile of evidence that isn't useful, and then a whole bunch of people doing stuff that's ignoring this pile of evidence. So, um, it, I think that's been a, a key learning for me over my career, and it's sort of funny because I'm not exactly the most extroverted person. You wouldn't think of me as being the one to like advocate for you must interact with humans, mm -hmm. but in fact, you must interact with other humans yeah. that are not like yourself in yeah. order to bring these worlds closer together. Yeah, I guess I agree totally. You know, the work of using evidence in your practice isn't always easy. It's complicated in and of itself, but it's also sometimes very confronting, not only to what you take to be true, but also sometimes your values. And mm -hmm. that's a really challenging process. And throw that into the mix then in collaborative situations and working in teams. Yeah, uh, it's difficult to persist sometimes unless you do, as you say, work in a community of practitioners and researchers and I guess because it's so complex and challenging it, it takes the village. Just yeah. going to give you the comment here in the chat from Nuda Taff who works with the, the Professional Development Service for Teachers. 
Uh, very taken with Carrie's words that practitioners solve problems and researchers answer questions. So important that we empower our teachers to see themselves as researchers in the context of teacher research and indeed action research self-study. Huge opportunities for communities of practice and professional learning communities in this context too. I guess you'd agree with that, Carrie. Oh, totally agree. And I would add also research practice partnerships because I think of communities of practice as, as being more within the education setting. Great. And ones that bridge into the research community as well, I think could be really, really helpful because mm -hmm. they generate these conversations that need to happen. That's, yeah. it's, that's the, the social dimension of research use is, is critical. Yeah, yeah. Well, Carrie, I'm just conscious of time and everybody's time and it's Friday evening it's Friday here. Friday afternoon for you guys. I hope it, everybody listening is like sitting with a glass of wine at least or something. Yeah. <laughs> and the festive season is starting it's upon us so all that remains for me to say Carrie is to wholeheartedly thank you for your generosity of time both in leading up to today's event and also being here and sharing your wonderful insights and research with us also again just to say that your recent book that you published with Nora Gordon Common Sense Evidence Use just to give that a plug and say that that is uh, uh, available there for people to to take forward here it is, here it is. It's from Harvard Education Press. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, which is at CL Conaway, and look at the thing, there's a, um, a way you can get a discount for the next couple of weeks on the book. So super. Uh, That's really great to know. Thank you very much. And you've also kindly put your email in the chat. So yes. thank you so very much. And oh, wishing yeah. you a great weekend and everybody who's been in attendance. And take care. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Thank you so much for inviting me. Have a good evening.